If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. this program is a blessing to you and I also want to say that it's our desire to deal with the theological issues more than the personalities. On the other hand, it's very hard to get to talk about the theology without the personality. But we believe that God would have us from His Word or instruct us from His Word and has instructed us to examine the teachings that we hear just as you ought to examine the ministry of impact as you listen to it each and every week. You ought to examine what we say from the Word of God. You're a priest before God and you have access to the Father and you have the Spirit of God living in you and you have the Word of God and you can study the Bible and see if what we say is the truth or not. I hope you enjoy this program. Mr. Horton, welcome to Impact again. Thanks, Pastor. Good to be with you again today. We're not talking about little incidental things. We're talking about things that cut the very roots of, of Christianity, the deity of Jesus Christ. I'm no God, and you're no God. There's one God. Deuteronomy says there's one God. Uh, we do believe in the Trinity, but there's still one God. <laughs> and God's not going around making us little gods or anyone else. But yet, here are some, quote, leading preachers who are saying that we're God's and uh, it, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. It just goes on and on and on. Absolutely. What, what's going on in our society? Well, I think really the same thing that uh, Satan has been trying to do throughout church history, get us to believe the lie in Genesis 3. You shall be as gods. Uh, it, was, it was the lie that uh, the, the Persian religions uh, propagated. It was the lie that uh, Greek religion propagated and the Gnosticism which that Greek religion produced, which meshed with Christianity to produce uh, a ghastly heresy in the first and second century church. Well, that same heresy has poked its head through church history again and again and again. Satan keeps trying to sell it. Well, he sold it pretty well this century. And uh, many people who claim to be Christians are buying it and selling it, not only here, but as you mentioned, in the Soviet Union, Union which you've seen firsthand, uh, in Central America, which I've seen firsthand. It's a tragedy that the distribution of this heresy, you shall be as God's. It's exactly what they're teaching. Now, for the listening audience, or the viewing audience, what are some of the leading, who are some of the leading proponents of this well, for one, uh, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland is really the leading popularizer of this stuff right now. He says, you need to realize that you are not a spiritual schizophrenic, half God and half Satan. You're all God. He says, you don't have a God in you. You are one. I say this and repeat it so it don't upset you too bad. When I read in the Bible where Jesus says, I am, I, capital A, am, I say, yes, I am, capital A, too. Well, of course, that was the revelation of God in Exodus to Moses. Whom shall I say sent me? And God says, tell him, I am sent you, I, capital A. And Copeland is attributing to himself, I am status, divine status. Well, when Shirley MacLaine does this in a made-for-TV movie, the evangelicals go berserk, say, this is terrible. She's saying, I am God, I am God, I am God. She says it on television with her New Age stuff. When she does it, the evangelicals go crazy. But when someone inside the evangelical camp does it, it's, it, it seems very difficult to convince brothers and sisters that, that a person who says this isn't a Christian. 
Now, for people that, have, that did not see our first program, your book that uh, you're holding there, and as I'm holding here, The Agony of Deceit, mm -hmm. your motivation for compiling as well as writing some of the material was to expose the error of these people's way. Absolutely, and again, it, it wasn't just uh, my project. It, you have R.C. Sproul, Walter Martin, uh, former C Surgeon General C. Everett Koop, people who really have uh, put a lot on the line. Uh, I, I, I would like to think that our motives were, were simply we wanted to see these errors exposed because there is, an, there is a common misconception in the church today that you can separate doctrine from, from, from life or doctrine from experience, or the head from the heart. And you really can't. Uh, we are what we think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Um, the, the Apostle Paul warned Timothy, watch your doctrine closely, because by doing that, you save your soul and the souls of others. Well, doctrine must be very important, uh, because it, it actually determines where we spend eternity. What I believe about God, about Jesus Christ, about the gospel, how I'm saved. Those doctrines which deal with those basic issues uh, are, are at the very heart of where we spend eternity. So we're dealing with people uh, like uh, Kenneth Copeland. Mm. Of course, I guess the granddaddy of them all is Kenneth Hagin is, is the yes. one. Yes. For instance, he says, physically we are born of human parents and partake of their nature. Spiritually we are born of God and partake of his nature. Um, another one is Earl Polk in Atlanta. He says, just as dogs have puppies and cats have kittens, so God has little gods. When I say act like a god, I can hear people saying, there he goes with that theory of the manifest sons of God. Forget about theories, forget about doctrine. We are little gods, whether you admit it or not. And, and, and the incredible thing is Christians are believing this. Yes. Well, and Paul Crouch, the president of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, uh, came on live television and told everyone, I am a little God, critics be gone. And R.C. Sproul in his chapter says, well, I'm one critic who won't be gone. R.C. Sproul was on a couple of times, his, his program. And Paul Crouch uh, uh, was evidently devastated when R.C. Sproul contributed a chapter to this book. But he had no idea, as many have no idea really what these people are teaching. If you don't watch them and actually read their literature, it's difficult to tell sometimes uh, what it is they're teaching. What, uh, I asked you on the last program, but I'll ask you again, people are waking up though. There are some people waking yes. up to this thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, I guess the greatest need today is for the ministers to wake up around the country that are kind of the, the disciples. You know, I heard uh, um, Kenneth Hagin several years ago make a statement that uh, his job was God gives him the revelation mm. and he's to give it out to the preachers and the preachers in the pulpits are to convey it to their people. And uh, so, uh, if anything, we need to wake up pastors across this land. Yes. Uh, because uh, this 30-minute this telecast is not going to be uh, enough for people to... Uh, to be shaken. In fact, I'm sure there are people watching us right now uh, mad enough to uh, to spit or they'd like to grab <laughs> you and me and, and choke us. Uh, you, I think you've had a few threats on your <laughs> on your life from some, these, these people. But um, there doesn't seem to be any end to it. I mean, we're looking at people, and, and I want to, you may not want to say anything about this person, but I, I watch and I am totally amazed that people can believe for instance, this, uh, the, there's a mass movement now uh, of followers of Benny Hinn mm. out, of, out of Florida. Mm -hmm. And this man is uh, propagating all kinds of garbage and riffraff and lies, mm -hmm. and yet people are believing it. Uh, here recently, uh, the, by one of the uh, 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 ministries in California, Benny Hinn was exposed of believing in nine gods. Sure. Now he says he doesn't believe that, I've heard. Of course, then I heard that that's not totally true, so I don't know what to believe. But I may have been accused of a lot of things, but I've never been accused of preaching nine gods. <laughs> and and uh, so well, where, where do you draw the line? It just keeps on and sure. on and on and on. Well, first of all, he, 
uh, he did teach very clearly. I've heard him uh, teach. I have it in print, have it on tape. Uh, many times that there were nine gods, and so if in fact he has gone back now and has repudiated that, that's great, but what it means is he was uh, claiming to be receiving that doctrine from God all along and has now repudiated having received it. So if he repudiates it, he has to admit also that he was lying when he said he received it from God because God doesn't, God always tells the truth. And I don't think he's willing to do that. And the sad thing is He's got the number one best-selling book in the country right now. By a, a mainstream evangelical publisher. I have a book published with that same publisher. It's a mainstream evangelical book, number one on the bestseller list. Christian pastors who are even uh, uh, pastors of supposedly sound churches are reading that and eating it up. It's a real tragedy that, there's, that there is a, a dearth of good Christian literature out there. Uh, I think so frequently pastors these days are reading fluff. They're not reading the great theological right. works. Uh, They're fetish. It's fetish reading or yeah. I call it, I call a lot of the books reading today, that are out today howdy doody books. How to do this and how to do that. <laughs> that's, so, that's, that's what we've got today. Yes. We've got a multitude of those. I mean not only you take Benny Hinn's mm -hmm. heresy but you take, uh, you just look at the best-selling books, the top ten the majority of them are um, dealing with health, mm -hmm. dealing with uh, uh, codependency, yeah. dealing with, uh, but, but you, you write a book on theology, mm -hmm. you write a book on uh, the f doctrines of the faith, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, you know, you might sell 10,000 copies, you might sell 5,000 copies. Of course, again, we're, we're living in the age today where uh, people pay others to think for them. That's right. And Paul said, in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. Um, so we give them a self-esteem gospel. It says Absolutely. that they will be uh, greedy, so we give them a prosperity gospel. It says that they will be uh, uh, lovers of pleasure, so we give them health, wealth, and happiness. N whatever they want, um, it, no matter how pagan the world gets, evangelicalism, uh, and I, I use the term broadly, uh, is seeming in our century to stoop as low as the culture wants them to go. The wonderful thing, and I, I don't want us just to be the uh, total negative without this positive note, I'm glad that God is a sovereign God. You bet. And He is not bound to man. God's going to do His work, His sovereign will. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility and all of that, but I'm glad that God's sovereign yeah. because if He wasn't, as some would want us to believe. Mm -hmm. God can't do this unless mm -hmm. we do that. Mm -hmm. I heard, I heard Paul, Paul Krauts the other night say on the television that uh, God backs us up. Whatever we do, He backs us up. In other words, <laughs> if, you, nice? <laughs> if you bind it here on earth, God will oh. back you up and bind it in heaven. That's not what the Scripture says. No. The Scripture says, now in the King James it will say that, or the English translation, but the Greek text, uh, well, I'll tell you, they can get an amplified Bible in, in, uh, in the English. And it'll tell you, it says what we have bound here must have already been bound there. We can't go around and say, I bind this and I bind that. Now, God, you're obligated to do what I... That completely reverses. The, it, I become sovereign, and, and he becomes the, the, the puppet to my, to my quote, sovereign uh, uh, will. So, but I am glad that God is a sovereign God and that God is going to um, do his will. Uh, regardless of all of this. So we're not, you know, I, I tell people uh, sometimes, and uh, this is, uh, uh, I think it's a very important truth, but it's kind of funny, humorous. Uh, we're not on the winning side, as some people say. We're on the side that won. Oh, you, that's tremendous. You can, you can lose in the last 30 seconds of a game. Mm -hmm. I, there are a lot of preachers running around. We're on the winning side. That's not true. We're on the side that won. Calvary settled it all. Absolutely. We won. Now God, in fact, I was reading just this morning of this taping that God's works were finished from the beginning. Hmm. And God's just working out what He decided a long time ago. And I'm so glad that we don't have to uh, create our own destiny. We don't have yep. to create our own, uh, as some of our so-called faith uh, people and blab it and grab it, we have mm -hmm. to create our own um, uh, lives and our own, by, through positive confession and yes. all that kind of stuff. I'm just so glad that God's a sovereign God. Lester Summerall has written a book uh, titled, The Will, the Most Powerful Force in the Universe. 
And uh, he says, your will is sovereign in your universe. My goodness. And I thought, not only is that idolatry and, and blasphemy, but really, how could you live like that? How could you live actually thinking that everything depended on you? Your salvation, your hope, your happiness, it all depended on what decisions you were going to make today in the course of a day. I know how many times I screw up. I know how many times, if, if left to myself, Absolutely. everything would fall to pieces. And I just, I, like you, I, I thank the Lord that He's sovereign. And when, even with the church, I remember a conversation with the U.S. Senate Chaplain Richard Halverson. He says, you know, uh, I believe it when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He says, I believe that. I believe he's still building his church. The problem is the one we're building. Mm. Boy, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a powerful statement. Back to the issue at hand that we're dealing with, um, everything we're saying, uh, you know, again, well, obviously we believe it, but we've got people viewing us that, that um, they're going to have a hard time. They're going to have a mm -hmm. hard time ex because we're dealing with guys that that are powerful. We're not just dealing with uh, some guy out in a, co a country bumpkin out here in the in the in the uh, country. We're dealing with people who, uh, well, you take TBN for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're in what 20 million homes mm -hmm. a, a day, and it's just constant pump, uh, pumped. And they believe it. You know, it's pretty intimidating for me to sit here and tell you, Michael. God told me that I am an end-time ministry, and God told... You know, that's intimidating. Yes. When somebody comes into my office and they tell me, God told me, I don't even, I, I don't even respond. Mm -hmm. for, because, not that I believe that God told them, but I don't respond. If God told them, who am I to even say anything mm -hmm. to? Now, if they come in with questions, Pastor, what about this, what about that? That's a different story. But it's intimidating when these guys are always saying, God this and God that. And of course, I don't believe them. I believe that we have the revelation of God. Right. God is given illumination of the revelation today, but he is not giving all this chit-chat talk. Mm -hmm. it's, like, uh, it's like Kenneth Copeland. Sometimes you'll see him preaching, and all of a sudden he'll stop, and he'll say, uh, what did you say, Lord? Well, you know, if God ever speaks to you, he won't stutter. You won't have to ask That's him right. what he said. That's right. I mean, Paul, Paul uh, immediately on the road to Damascus, Saul then, uh, God didn't stutter with him when he spoke to him. But it's, it's this chit-chat today. Yes. These guys are just chit-chatting. I, I, I love in one of uh, John MacArthur's books that has just been written, a statement that he makes in there about a leading charismatic or charismatic pastor said that uh, he was shaving one day and Jesus appeared to him in his bathroom. And uh, uh, Dr. MacArthur asked him, the question, well, did you stop shaving? And uh, the point is the familiar, becoming familiar with the things of God. I mean, anytime I see in the Bible where people saw God, they fell as a dead man at his feet. Sure. They didn't keep shaving and, and having on a conversa sure. carrying on a conversation. You would have at least cut yourself pretty bad. Probably so. Sure. So it's, it's we're, the, uh, in the uh, Ten Commandments, for instance, taking the name of the Lord God in vain, Today, there is just a casual handling of the things of God. Yeah. It's just, you know, uh, Jan Crouch says she saw an angel on the airplane in tennis shoes waving at her. Uh, it, it's unbelievable uh, of things that are going on today. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, one bumper sticker we have out in California, God is rad, he's my dad. Uh, it, God is what? God is rad, he's my dad. Sh rad short for radical, he's my dad. <laughs> Far cry from pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, I got a uh, newsletter from a youth pastor of a local church here in this area. And uh, he was, it was actually a copy of one somebody brought me. And uh, he was writing to his young people, telling them about youth camp. Hmm. And one of his last statements was, and oh, by the way, Papa will be there. And uh, talking about God. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just, that's, uh, and, and I know where they get that verse of Scripture and, and all of that. And uh, it's just unbelievable. We could go on. We, we've talked just briefly. Kenneth Hagin. You know, and by the way, I don't know if you've done a lot of research 
on this, but um, there have been a lot of uh, suspicions of, uh, of Mr. Hagen plagiarizing mm-hmm. uh, E.W. Kenyon's material. And, of course, Kenyon was, uh, who was Kenyon? Well, D.R. McConnell has documented this thoroughly in his book, A Different Gospel. And uh, in there, he, and also in other, other works, for instance, Judith Mata's The Born Again Jesus, uh, they, they chart the history of this movement back to, Ken, uh, to, to uh, Kenyon. And Kenyon was really the father of the faith movement. If you go into faith bookstores where they have the Copeland and Hagen books, they will also have Kenyon there. And uh, Kenyon was up to his eyeballs in uh, Christian science. And for those who know Christian science know that it denies the reality of evil, the reality of sickness. All of that is an illusion, which is very... That's Gnosticism. It's Gnosticism, and it's very consistent with what the faith teachers believe and preach. In fact, the faith teachers go so far as to say, as Hagen and Copeland and company have done, uh, I am not a sinner saved by grace. You may be a sinner saved by grace, but I, I deny the reality of sin and evil. And uh, this is nothing uh, short of denying the gospel because um, John says those who deny the reality of sin in their own lives even uh, do not have the truth of God in them. Yeah, they deceive themselves. Absolutely. Uh, Make God a liar. Yeah, and, and James, I think it's the last verse of James uh, 4 or 5, I can't remember, but he makes it quite clear that we're still sinners Absolutely. even though we're saved. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, sometimes you'll make the statement that I, that we're, or they'll make the statements, well, we're not sinners, we're saints. Well, we're sinning saints. Yeah, uh, we're sinful right. saints. That's right. And uh, the Bible makes that clear. Man is, uh, is totally depraved, mm-hmm. and once God saves us, uh, it's, we are what we are by the grace of God. Absolutely. And uh, it, it, it really comes to, the, to, to deifying man's what it comes to. It's back to that ancient lie in the Garden of Eden, you shall be as gods. I don't know how many times in the history of the Christian church we have to hear that lie before we start taking it seriously, before we start saying, okay, this time we're not going to buy into it. This time we're going to push it away from us and say, no, this is what the Lord says. You know, unlike Adam, when the second Adam, Jesus Christ, was faced with the devil this time not in the Garden of Eden, but on that high pinnacle during the temptation. Devil says, come on, you'll be like God. You'll have all these kingdoms of the earth. I'll give them all to you. And what does Jesus do? He quotes scripture. Right. And I don't think that the, the average Christian watching these people can quote scripture. Mm-hmm. I don't think the average person hooked on Hagen and Copeland can, can quote scripture at the devil when he says, come on, believe this stuff. You can be, what does it say here? Kenneth Hagen. You are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. Every man who's been born again is an incarnation, and Christianity is a miracle. You are as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. Every time the devil or Kenneth Hagin, speaking as the mouthpiece of Satan, says that, the Christian ought to be able to say, the man, the man shall not live by bread alone. You know, I read a, I read a quote or a statement a few weeks ago it was a statement by Polycarp, mm. a disciple mm. of John. And uh, he said that John was in a public bathhouse yes. with Serenius uh, back in the first century, who was a, a, a Gnostic mm-hmm. who taught this kind of junk. Mm-hmm. And John ran out of the bathhouse saying he was afraid that the judgment of God was going to fall on that place Why? because this heretic is here. He said, lest his heretical water wash over onto me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he didn't have much Christian love, the disciple John, did he? Yeah, yeah, that's what they would say. <laughs> that's right. But uh, there is a clear, and there is a clear illustration that that uh, we're not to have anything to do with these people. Mm-hmm. But uh, I want to just say to those that are listening that that uh, we certainly don't have the time to go into all of this. But Mr. Horton has written a book, and actually he edited it, but also he wrote some of the chapters. Uh, the name of the book is The Agony of Deceit. Now, I'll hold it right here. It may be a little shiny for you, but The Agony of Deceit. It's published by Moody Press, and uh, there are some tremendous endorsements on the back of it. Howard Hendricks, who was at Dallas Theological Seminary, James Montgomery Boyce, a great writer, David Maines, 
and Ray Stedman. You've seen uh, Dr. Stedman's books uh, in the bookstores. This is not just a book that uh, Mr. Horton dreamed up. Uh, well, he may have dreamed it up or got it in his mind, but yet it is a book that's endorsed by leading evangelicals of our country. You owe it to yourself to read this book. You owe it to your friends to expose them to the book. And then you make the decision whether he is right or he is wrong. We hope this program has been a blessing to you. If you'd like to know more about how, to get, how you can get this book, you certainly can write me here, and uh, there'll be a, a, an address at the very end, and you can write us, and we'll be happy to tell you how you can get it. Uh, and again, we just want to say that it's our desire to expose you to truth, and then you have to make the decision after that. And again, I want to thank Mr. Horton for being with us on this program, and uh, till next time, may the Lord bless you. We thank you so much for watching this program. God bless you. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 